So I'm Harvey Leo. I'm with the Center of Managing Chronic Disease at University of Michigan. And I'm with Dr. Newberry, a pathologist at uh, Rady Children's Hospital. And we're just going to ask a couple questions about what his job is as a pathologist and some basic questions about eosinophilic disorders. And so the first question is, what actually is an eosinophil and what's its role in the body? An eosinophil is one of, one of many white blood cells that are um, throughout the bloodstream and sometimes in the tissue. Um, it's distinctive because unlike some of the other blood cells that we see in the bloodstream like lymphocytes, monocytes, and neutrophils, um, when you look at it under the microscope, it's very distinctive because it has bright red eosinophilic granules or, you know, eosinophilic because they stain with a dye named eos eosin. So it's very distinctive that way under the microscope. And frequently it has two lobes. It's a bilobed, brightly eosinophilic um, cell that is seen throughout the, the GI tract, certainly except in the esophagus, but also in small numbers and, and sometimes other parts of the body. Um, they're frequently increased in allergic reactions, um, but they're not specific for that. Sometimes you can see them with parasitic infections. Sometimes you can see them in other uh, disorders, um, eosinophilic granuloma. Do they typically happen in cancers? Uh, no, they're not. They, they can be seen in some cancers, but no, they're not typically seen in cancer. And what, what's the job of the eosinophil in the body? Um, it is, well, with a parasitic infection, the, the granules contain a lot of um, enzymes and, and, and proteases and things that attack the, the, the parasite and sort of um, just help destroy the parasite. They're also important in, in allergic reactions, in, in not so much that they help protect, but that they are a response to an, to an allergic reaction. They release the enzymes and, and the proteases that are within the granules, and that causes uh, might cause some, some flushing, might cause other tissue reactions. And compared to other white blood cells, are they the most common? Are they the least common? They are one of the least common. In the peripheral bloodstream, neutrophils um, in, in adults are the most common. In young babies, lymphocytes are the most common. Um, in adults, perhaps the most common are neutrophils, and then lymphocytes, and then monocytes, and then eosinophils are the, probably the, the fourth most common peripheral um, blood cell and normally they occupy about you know one to five percent of the white blood cells that are in the peripheral so blood. So even in a healthy person they'll have eosinophils in their body? Yes, yes. Great. Now are eosinophils responsive to different types of medications? Can we make them go away? Um, we can't make them go away, um, certainly not, not entirely. Sometimes with steroids they will go away as will other, other inflammatory cells. Um, but you can't really make them go away in entirely. And are they just in the bloodstream? Can they move into tissues? Will they be all over the body? Um, they certainly move, move in, into tissue. Um, in eosinophilic esophagitis, of course, they're, they're, they move into the uh, um, esophageal um, you know, mucosa um, tissue. They're normally found throughout other parts of the GI tract in, in small numbers, um, but they're also found in small numbers um, in, in other organs, sometimes you see a small number in the liver, sometimes you may see a small number in kidneys, but sometimes that is, they're increased, particularly in the kidney, with an allergic type of disease. And when we're talking about meeting with a gastroenterologist, whether a pediatric or adult, and they talk about biopsies, what actually is a biopsy? A biopsy, certainly for, for a, a gastrointestinal biopsy, it's a small amount of tissue. It's probably anywhere from one to two, to two or three millimeters in maximum dimension that's taken with the endoscope. Um, they sort of take a little bite off of, the, off of the superficial part of the mucosa. And then that, that tissue is then placed in formalin, um, generally for routine pathologic examination. And then that, once that, we receive that tissue in formalin, um, the hist histotex um, process that it gets um, processed, um, usually auto, you know, in an in automated process or in various gradations of formalin and alcohol, and eventually gets put in paraffin or in wax, and then that tissue gets embedded in, in the wax and, and then is cut very thinly, and then those um, cut sections of tissue are stained with the routine stain, which is a hematoxylin and eosin stain, and then those are given um, to the pathologist for examination under the microscope. And those stains help the pathologist actually see those tissues compared to other tissues and separate tissues out, correct? Right. I mean, you can separate out the different types of inflammatory cells, eosinophils versus neutrophils versus lymphocytes, and that you can certainly separate them out, them, separate them out from 
um, you know, the, the mucosal epithelial cells. And are the tissue, are the biopsy specimens and the tissues you're looking at, are the cells are still moving or are they already stuck in? No, in they're, they're, th those tissue, those cells die once they are put in formalin. They die within a matter of seconds once they're put in formalin. And when a person has a biopsy done, how soon usually does a pathologist go and look at the slides? Is it weeks later? Is it within the day? N usually it's the following day. And what are the things you look for when you actually are looking at a gastrointestinal sample for a biopsy? Um, depends on, on, on the a site, but generally we're looking to see um, if there's increased numbers of inflammatory cells, either eosinophils or neutrophils or lymphocytes. Um, we're looking to see if there's um, if the maturation of the epithelium or the, or the surface of the tissue is normal, whether or not there are increased numbers of mitotic figures or if the, or if the tissue is trying to repair itself or divide. We're looking to see if there are ulcers um, in the esophagus. We're looking to see if the lower portion of the mucosa or the epithelium is proliferative, you know, that is if it's increased in thickness. Um, we also assess whether or not there are um, edema in the tissue, if there's increased sort of water, if you will, in between the, between the tissue cells. Um, m many other things. It depends on exactly on what site you're looking at and sort of perhaps what the um, clinical situation is. We're also looking for, we may be looking for um, infectious agents like candida. We may be looking for, for viruses. We may be looking for, you know, we're looking for bacteria. And some of these things, when it comes to eosinophil focal esophagitis, can get very confusing. These things will look alike. Uh, the number, you can certainly see eosinophils in a lot of different disorders. Um, the, the other features that, that may cause eosinophils, such as candida, those are usually fairly distinctive and you can, you can easily separate them out. Some other diseases that may cause um, eosinophils in the esophagus, such as inflammatory bowel disease or Crohn's disease, or the effect of um, ingestion of acid or lye, or sometimes the effect of some drugs can be more difficult to sort out. Um, and the, the findings may not, may not be really all that specific. And do the tissues at different parts of the esophagus or stomach or intestines look different to you as a, as a pathologist? Y yes, I mean, the, the normal histology or the normal picture of, of the tissue in the esophagus is very different from that in the stomach and from that in the other parts of the gastrointestinal tract. When you do get a biopsy specimen that someone's worried about eosinophil focal esophagitis, lots of people talk about counting eosinophils. Does mm -hmm. it sound as simple as you're actually counting the number of these little dots on uh, a microscope? Yes, yeah, sometimes it is, it is that simple. We, we, we look at it under high, a high power magnification, which is you know a, a 400x, the tissue is magnified. Well, we, start, we start at a low power and just get a general assessment of how much inflammation is there and whether or not the tissue is well oriented, if there may be other things. And then we usually go to um, consecutively higher powers and eventually end up at a 400x magnification of what we typically call as a, you know, a high power field. And for eosinophilic esophagitis, you know, we're counting the number of eosinophils there in the tissue. Now sometimes they're, they're clustered together and it may be hard to distinguish, you know, if we've got dealing with a single eosinophil or sometimes a cluster of two or three. Um, in eosinophilic esophagitis, um, it's not uncommon for the eosinophils to um, if you will, burst and degranulate or shed their, shed their granules. So instead of having a, uh, an intact eosinophil where we can see the nucleus, we're left with sort of a, a sheet of, of, of eosinophil granules. And it, then it's dip, much more difficult to, to decide how many eosinophils are in that field. And are there other chemicals or tests that you can do when you look at a biopsy specimen to, to tell the difference between eosinophil focal esophagitis and other diseases? Um, there are other features that we look at um, when we're trying to decide on a, if, if a patient has a diagnosis of eosinophilic esophagitis, um, the thickness of the, of the basal zone um, typically increases, um, but that may be seen in other diseases such as reflex disease. Um, we may see clusters or abscesses of, of eosinophils. Um, we may see the, the, the luminal layer or the superficial layer of the esophagus tend to sort of degenerate or fall apart. Those are typically seen in eosinophilic esophagitis and usually more frequently seen in eosinophilic esophagitis than in other disorders, but it's sort of a combination of, of all those things, as, as well as um, if there's disease in all throughout the esophagus or, or mainly in the lower part of the esophagus. So it's a combination of, of multiple factors which um, help us decide whether or not a patient has eosinophilic esophagitis. Um, probably one of, the, one of the biggest things, though, is the number of eosinophils. 
And lots of families are worried about getting biopsies and the process of getting biopsies. Are there things that a pathologist or other scientist can do through blood work to help figure out if someone has eosinophil focus or certain um, diseases? Currently, no. I mean, the diagnosis is, is, is made on, on the findings on the biopsy in combination with the findings that the, um, the endoscopist sees when he's scoping the patient and symptomatology. So currently, no, a biopsy is needed to make a diagnosis. And how soon after someone starts an appropriate treatment their doctor offers them, do you think you would see a change on their biopsy specimens that you receive? Probably within several weeks or a month, perhaps even before that, but we typically, patients don't typically get rebiopsied, I, I would think, for at least a month, perhaps even longer. And do you think people who've had who may have to have lots of biopsies, or are there changes in the esophagus and the tissues that change depending on the age of the child or person over time? Uh, I don't think not so much necessarily in the age of the, of the patient or the child, but I think more with, with, with treatment. Okay. And do you think that, um, again, an older person has a biopsy, does it look different than a young child's biopsy even if they don't have disease? Is there uh, actually a difference pathologically, or is everybody's tissues it, look the same? Everybody's tissue pretty much looks the same. There's no really no difference between a, 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 a child of, of two or three's esophagus as opposed to an adult, except in very, very young patients, and we're talking maybe just a few months, the, the mucosal layer may be a little thinner.